Hello everybody, welcome to church. We are glad that you are with us today. I'm Pastor Steve Green, my wife Penny and I pastor here at Brighton Word of Faith Church. Today is Sunday, November 21st. The title of our message today is Let Us Hold Fast Our Confession. The purpose is is that we would uh, participate fully in the reward that God has for us on the earth. There are rewards in eternity and there are also rewards here for us in this present time. And uh, our confession plays a role in that, an important role, and we want to have a look at that as well. Uh, There's one thing really that we're asked to do uh, by God while we're here on the earth, and if we do that one thing, then everything else that God wants to happen in our lives, everything He wants to do through us, will come to pass as a consequence of that. And that one thing is to have a repentant heart. In previous weeks, we've looked at Matthew 3 verses 1 to three and from those three verses we've seen a definition a good working definition of what it means to repent number one it means to adjust our thinking uh, to continually acknowledge that was number two number three the authority of heaven number four in the person of Jesus again it's to adjust our thinking to continually acknowledge the authority of heaven in the person of Jesus if we can do that Uh, and put that to good practice daily, then as I said, everything that God wills and wishes for us in this life will come to pass. This is how we become a spiritual person, a spiritual man or a spiritual woman. So illustrating the difference between what is soulish and what is spiritual. Again, we're talking about how to become spiritual. Um, a, a, A counterpoint to spiritual used in some places in the New Testament is soulish. Soulish is different than spiritual. And so there are many examples of it. And uh, Jesus in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount gives us a number of examples. We read in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, this is his last example in chapter 5. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now that would be a good example of soulish. Soulish isn't trying to be bad, it's trying to be good. Um, a soul, uh, when we live according to our soul, you know, there are standards of righteousness we're trying for, but it only goes so far. And again, this would be a good example of it. Um, a, a good soulish person would aspire to, would make it their goal, would try to love their neighbor. Um, but at the same time, and this is perfectly normal, uh, we've all done it. Um, But at the same time, a soulish person would hate their enemy. That's what enemies are like. Uh, They're there to be hated. (laughs) And um, uh, Jesus continues. He says, but, okay, there's a whole different um, way of doing this. Um, And that's what he's bringing to our attention. There's a different standard of righteousness, a higher standard of righteousness, a standard that produces not soulishness, but produces spiritual spirituality. <laughs> it makes us spiritual. Jesus said, but I say to you, uh, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Uh, and a key point, verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So there's a, a result, a primary result that comes from from loving our enemies, and that is that we become sons of God in terms of how we function. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? And that's another key word. We've mentioned it already, um, and uh, we'll be going into more detail on it, is the idea of getting a reward. What reward have you? Uh, Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And another key thought there, being perfect. We'll come back to that. So as we've said, to love our neighbor and hate our enemy is a natural, soulish standard of righteousness. Uh, Not only that, but it can actually serve as a shield against true righteousness. In other words, if true righteousness is is loving my enemy, and I don't love my enemy, I hate him, but I do love my neighbor, then the fact I love my neighbor may be shielding 
uh, the fact that I'm not loving my enemy. I'll be presenting myself as righteous when in fact I'm not as righteous as I need to be. And, and the substandard or lower level of righteousness is obscuring the fact that I'm really not righteous at all, at least not with the righteousness that I need to be. So it's in a way, um, this level of righteousness is, can be worse than not being righteous at all. Yeah, having no righteousness, not even soulish, because at least if I have no righteousness, it's apparent <laughs> to everybody. Um, but this can be deceiving because it appears to be good righteousness and it's not. Um, <clears throat> the words of Jesus mark the transition to being a spiritual man. Jesus said in John 6, 6, 6, 63, the words that I speak, and notice here in this passage, he says, but I say to you, I say to you, love your enemies. He said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So this is our transition into the spiritual world, into being a spiritual person. When Jesus said, uh, but I say, then in the next verse, he started by saying that you may. And that is a key uh, perspective to have. His words are not adding an unnecessary burden to our lives. Now we've got something more to do and not only is it something more, it's hard. We got to love our enemies. That's not the purpose of it. His words are authoritative. They are granting us power. Uh, there is power that flows through the authority of Jesus and that power now enables us to perform what Jesus said. In other words, uh, verse 44, but I say, verse Verse 45, that you may. Uh, so his words are opening um, to us the riches of heaven. They're opening to us a possibility. They're opening to us an ability to do what we otherwise couldn't do. And the result of that ability is that we enjoy a reward. We enjoy the blessings of heaven. So his words, again, let me repeat, are not adding an unwelcome burden to us, but rather they are opening the doorway for us into the kingdom of heaven. That's why these words are called the gospel. This message is the gospel of the kingdom. It's what Jesus preached wherever he went. Uh, so he says to us, these are his words, he says, love our enemies, bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who, despiteful, who spitefully use us and per persecute us. Notice that the main outcome of these things um, is not what happens to our enemy. Our enemy is getting loved. They are being blessed. Good is being done to them. They are being prayed for. So there is an impact on our enemy. But the main outcome is not what happens to our enemy. It's what happens to us. The result is we are made to be the sons of God. We're made to be a spiritual man. We are made to have a reward and we are made perfect. So here's examples of the reward. Uh, we've looked at these before, but we want to keep these front and center in our mind because this is a motivation. It's a key motivation toward wanting to be a spiritual man. Um, the, the spiritual man does receive the things of the Spirit of God. The soulish man, as we read uh, in previous weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. So in James 1.21, well, we'll just look at uh, a number of different scriptures here that give us the example of the reward that he's talking about. In James 1.21, uh, we, we are, um, the, pardon me, <laughs> uh, we receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. So there's a salvation of our soul that happens. This is part of the reward. Salvation of our soul means our soul works right. Instead of having anxiety, we have peace. Instead of having depression, we have joy. We are working. We're functioning in the manner that God intended us to. Our soul is being saved. That's part of the reward. Another part of the reward is whatever we ask, we receive from Him. We see that in 1 John 3.22. Another part of the reward is, is that we love life and see good days. Uh, that's in 1 Peter 3 and verse 10. And you'll notice, as we've drawn your attention to this before, and we'll do it again, here is that these are not small blessings. These are not momentary um, little exceptions to the rule, a nice little glimmer of hope occasionally, nothing like that. These are 
uh, life-altering, uh, overarching promises that, that really um, I completely steer our life onto a higher level. Our soul is saved. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him. We love life and see good days. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, we read that He will exalt us in due time. Uh, again, that exaltation is not over people, but it's into His fullness. Uh, we read in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for our good. That would mean uh, there are numerous things that happen in life. Not all, of, uh, not all of them initially are for our good. Some of them appear to be very much detrimental to us. They're um, the works of the adversary. They're, there's troubles, um, adversities, different things such as that. But ultimately, as we continue faithful, everything works together for our good. That's an amazing promise. And another one in Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 3 to obedient children, that it may be well with you and that you would live long on the earth. Again, uh, a, a promise that encompasses the entirety of a person's life. So uh, another thing with that passage in Matthew chapter 5 in mind where Jesus says, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. He says, therefore you shall be made perfect. So with, uh, we want to touch on that again. Perfect, uh, again, we've made a bit of a point about it over months, maybe longer. Uh, I want to come back to it again just briefly, just because it can be uh, a, an unsettling word, possibly, a perhaps a little bit of a confusing word, perfect. It, it sounds unreasonable, unrealistic, impossible. Nobody is perfect. Uh, none of us are Jesus. We can't be perfect. How? Why are we talking about perfect? It's just, a, again, an unreasonable expectation. It puts pressure on me. That's what it might seem like. But actually, the word perfect, as it's being used in the Bible, is a perfect perfectly normal and possible thing that is, again, to our advantage, uh, it simply means being skilled in the word of righteousness. Um, in the same way that tradespeople, professional people, people that you consult in your life, could be an accountant, could be a lawyer, could be a doctor, could be uh, an electrician, it, anybody like that, you want a skilled person. That doesn't mean everything they do is perfect. It doesn't mean they've never made a mistake. It does mean that they're, they're good at what they do. And that is what God wants for us. He wants us to be good at what we do spiritually. He doesn't want us just to dabble in spiritual things. He wants us to be good at spiritual things. We read in Hebrews 5 verses 13 to 14, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There are those Christians who are, are less trained, less experienced, less disciplined, who are um, still spiritually immature and they're unskilled in the word of righteousness. That's what it would mean to be not be perfect. Um, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That's the Greek word teleos, same word used um, when Jesus says, therefore you shall be perfect, talking about love your enemies, therefore you shall be perfect. Very same word, uh, only here it's translated full age. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So this is a person who's practiced in the Word of God. This is a person who is skilled in righteousness, um, using a term from the previous verse. So uh, that is God's will for us, and that is part of the result of as we, as we with a repentant heart hear the words of Jesus, I say to you, I say, Jesus says, that you may be sons of God, that you may be perfect, that you may be rewarded. All of this comes by His words. His words are spirit. His words are life. And, and this um, opportunity is presented to us through these words being spoken to us to love our enemies, bless those that curse us, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us. Now. In order to do this, there is something that greatly uh, enhances uh, our ability to do this. Um, part of it is, is understanding the purpose of it. Part of it is understanding the reward of it. Um, that motivates us. It, it's a very powerful thing. Um, <clears throat> 
something else that we can uh, tap into. It's a provision from God. It's to help us overcome our weaknesses. And obviously, when it comes to loving our enemies, <laughs> they're just glaringly... Um, there would be a weakness that initially we all have. Um, it, it, it's, it's just not normal for a human being to love their enemy. There's probably no normal, normal in a natural soulish sense. There's probably no normal person who loves their enemies. Um, uh, so it is, uh, it is something where we are weak, where we need help. And so, uh, with that in mind, let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Uh, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So he, he doesn't say just hold fast our confession, but it's because we have a high priest. So we need to know what the role of high priest is, how this, why this is important. He says in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, Uh, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus, our high priest, um, again, high priest is a term that most of us are, uh, unless we've been specifically trained in the Word of God, uh, what it is, most of us are not familiar with what in the world... uh, Jesus as high priest would do for us. We're not acquainted with that. We don't usually have these in our lives um, on a natural level, I mean. And so our high priest, as it's revealed here in these three verses, uh, is, is, uh, fulfills this function, is that he sympathizes with our weaknesses. He's not condemning us, not ridiculing us, not criticizing us, not angry, frustrated, impatient, but he sympathizes with our weaknesses. One reason for this, a key reason for this, is that Jesus himself for 33 years lived in a mortal human body on the earth. So he knows what it feels like. So he sympathizes with our weaknesses. Uh, He sympathizes with our temptations. That would be um, a very similar thought that would go hand in hand with the first one. Um, he, he himself was tempted, as we read, in all points, just as we are. So he sympathizes with that. And he gives us grace to overcome our weaknesses. Grace is divine ability, divine power to function morally uh, in love on a higher level than what we would normally function just naturally. And so this is what the role of the high priest is. So seeing then that we have such a great high priest... Um, Jesus, the Son of God, now let us hold fast our confession. So our confession is going to be related to this idea that he's here to help us. There's something about me having the right confession that opens the door, that allows, that permits Jesus to function as my strengthener. Um, It is, our confession is a relational response Um, to our high priest in order that we can participate in his provision. It is a verbal statement. So what is our confession? It is a verbal statement of a covenant responsibility or provision from a believing heart. So anything that's in the covenant, the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, any kind of responsibility that you or I have, that can be the subject of our confession. Any kind of provision to us from God can be the subject of our confession. The confession is 100% uh, revolving around uh, covenant realities, covenant responsibilities, covenant provisions. That's what a confession is for, to affirm what the covenant says, and not just affirm what the covenant says, but to facilitate that that, uh, covenant aspect uh, so that it works, so that it's working. so it is from a believing heart it is faith not works that's that is really important and that's what i want to focus on for a few minutes that it's a confession of faith it's not a work it's not a natural work it's not a flesh work Um, this is important to emphasize because it so easily uh, can become just a natural thing it so easily can become just a, a natural work a work of our flesh a work of our own ability a work of um of just my natural 
functioning. Um, <clears throat> and we want to deliberately, intentionally avoid that. Uh, so the problem with uh, confession, if it's just a natural thing, is it produces no spiritual result, no spiritual consequence, and as such it's only frustrating. I could make the right confession, make it a dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times, and nothing happens. Uh, it, it, I'm sure there's been many Christians over the years that have even come to doubt their Bible or doubt um, uh, at least part of their Bible because they've confessed and confessed and, and nothing happened. Um, so it is it's, extremely important that we make the distinction between uh, a work of faith as opposed to a work of the flesh. A uh, hundred people can make, be making the same biblical confession and it can be coming from 100 different variations of heart. It all depends upon where each person's heart is and where, their, where our heart is on particular issues. So the right heart is one where we are using our confession in order to trust God, to take an issue and literally to dump it into His lap. In other words, to include Him, to make give Him His necessary and rightful responsibility in the matter, to, to roll the care of it, roll the, the weight of it over onto Him, literally dump it in His lap. He does not resent that. Sometimes on a natural level, we might resent if things are dumped in our lap. <laughs> but Jesus does not resent it because it's his job. That's what the high priest is. That's what he's here to do. The Bible says that he ever uh, lives to make intercession for us, that that um, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. This is a extremely powerful thing. It's a saving thing. It's, it's, it's what he lives for. Not only is he not resentful of it, he lives for this. Um, so we are committing ourselves in our confession. We are committing ourselves to him who judges righteously. We're taking um, the need that we have and rolling it over onto him so the weight of it rests upon him and that permits him to do his job. So then, to use an example, uh, I love my enemies. That would be uh, a that is a covenant responsibility, Jesus said, for me to do that. So now this becomes part of my covenant relationship with him to love my enemy. So what can I confess? I can confess a covenant responsibility that I can have. I can confess a covenant responsibility that Jesus has. Uh, anything that has to do with the covenant is good material for a confession. Uh, for example, just to divert for a moment from what we're talking about. Um, a covenant uh, or a uh, confession that has to do with a covenant provision to me might be something like this. Uh, that he has borne my sicknesses, he has carried my pains, and by his stripes I was healed. That isn't speaking of my responsibility, that's speaking of his provision to me. And that's a good confession to make. By his stripes, I've been healed. I am affirming, I'm confirming from my heart what the Lord Jesus has done for me, what he did for me through his uh, crucifixion. Praise the Lord. But for the moment, though, we're not talking about that. We are talking about our responsibilities. We're talking about areas where we potentially uh, will be weak, where we will have a temptation, a temptation that may be too much. In fact, it will be too much for us to overcome in our natural ability. And therefore, I make a confession. This is exactly what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Um, because he is sympathetic with our weaknesses, he's been tempted like we are. He's here to give us grace. It now is the time to hold fast our confession. Our confession being what it is that we need to do. The area where we would normally have a weakness. So I can say, I love my enemies. Just make it a statement, an affirmation. It is what my responsibility is and I am accepting that responsibility. I'm owning it. I say, I love my enemies. And in saying that, I'm taking the, the weight of it, the, the difficulty of it, and I'm rolling it over onto the Lord. So this is not just something I'm doing independently. It's not something I'm doing by myself. If I'm just doing it within myself, if I'm talking about uh, entirely my own ability, uh, 
Uh, if I was to say I love my enemies and what I think I'm doing is just asserting that I naturally have this ability. It's just the way I am. I must have been born this way. I'm just one of those guys that just loves my enemies. If, if that's what I'm saying, then, then there is no value to it. It is just a flesh thing. It's just a work. But if what I'm doing is acknowledging Jesus and His role in my life and His function as my high priest, uh, His function as my helper, and, and I'm taking the weight of it and just rolling it over onto Him. I'm committing the matter to Him. I'm committing myself to Him who judges righteously. Um, I'm acknowledging that I completely need His help, and it, because I believe in His help, I'm making a statement, I love my enemies. Then what will happen is, um, as I continue with that confession, as I hold it fast, it's not just a one-time time confession, it's a confession that I hold fast to, uh, then uh, this permits the grace of the Lord to flow into me. This allows Jesus to do His job. It's, it, per, it enables um, Him to strengthen me where I would otherwise be weak. Uh, so praise God. This is just a tremendous benefit. Um, it's a tremendous provision that we have in Christ. Um, it just makes all the difference in the world. So we want to emphasize this, to hold fast our confession. Praise the Lord. So um, one further point. And it's a point that we made last week and, and good to affirm it again, is that we we read earlier that that um, <clears throat> that Jesus said that if we would do what he said, but I say to you, I say to you, love your enemies and such, that you may be the sons of God, um, the sons of your Father in heaven. So so the result of us hearing and doing the words of Jesus is that we functionally become a son of God. Where just like God, um, He causes the rain to fall on the just and ju unjust. Um, he causes the sun to rise on the good and the evil. Um, as we are loving our enemies, we are functioning like God. We're doing the same thing God does. So we're, we're behaving as sons of God. It comes from the words of Jesus. That's what we read earlier. Here now in Romans 8, 13, um, we read, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The words that I speak to you, Jesus said, they are spirit. He said the role of the Holy Spirit is to bring to our remembrance the things that He has said. So there's this intimate connection between the Holy Spirit and the words that Jesus spoke. Um, he says, uh, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So it's the same thought there. That's what I want to bring to your consciousness, is that the Holy Spirit reminds us of the words of Jesus. So being led by the Spirit makes us sons of God. That's what we read here in Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Being led by the Spirit, um, for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. What's the Holy Spirit doing? He's bringing to our remembrance the things that Jesus spoke to us. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 26. So Jesus, when He spoke, He said, you hearing and doing my words, this makes you sons of your Father in heaven. So these are just two different ways of saying the same thing. So what we understand then is the, the leading of the Spirit primarily. There's different ways in which the, the leading of the Spirit works in our lives, but the primary way is that He causes us to be disciplined according to the words of Jesus. That is what makes us sons of God. That is what being led by the Spirit is. Um, obedient to the words of Jesus. He says in verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So there's this is the reward. This is the benefit if indeed we suffer with Him. So there's going to be a little bit of suffering associated with this uh, loving our enemy there's a part of us that doesn't want to and the and what we the attention we give to that part is nothing <laughs> 
<laughs> it's we don't indulge it we don't satisfy it we ignore it we pay no attention to it we we go with where the grace is we keep our confession we hold fast to our confession and and because i'm not yielding to a natural human desire then there is going to be a little bit of suffering associated with that but as we pointed out the rewards far far outweigh uh, whatever suffering there is but notice that he says um that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him. In other words, if we're not willing to uh, go through this little bit of suffering, then in fact we're not heirs of God and not joint heirs with Christ. So being led by the Spirit then is following the teaching of Jesus, uh, typically presented in the Sermon on the Mount. It makes us perfect, makes us a son of God, makes us spiritual. It's the entrance into a land that flows with milk and honey. It's entering his rest, it's our inheritance, it is our salvation. Well, thank you for joining us today. Again, we are thrilled that you're with us. We, we love your heartfelt uh, participation with us in the gospel, in being uh, all together sons and daughters of God. Thank you for joining us in this grand cause, this worthwhile cause that we have. Praise the Lord.